Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us tonight. I'm Larry Coco, Director of Educational Technology for the New Jersey Department of Education, and I'm hosting this webinar tonight as a Guild Officer for GAME, or Gamers Advancing Meaningful Education. This is the fourth webinar in our monthly series, which usually happens every third Thursday at 9 p.m. Eastern Time. However, just a little note, in December, our webinar is going to be on December 6th in deference for the holiday season. So what is GAME? We are an organization for educators who game, who want to learn how to game, and are looking to incorporate gaming strategies into teaching and learning. You can learn more at our website, and uh, the address should be up there on the screen right now. Um, or if you don't have time to jot that down, you can Google Gamers Advancing Meaningful Education, and you'll find the link there. Tonight, we'll be talking to Sherry Jones. Sherry Jones is a rhetoric, composition, and literature instructor who integrates the latest educational technology pedagogical models and rhetoric, composition, and literary theories to help students work with digital multimodal texts in order to create rhetorically compelling digital compositions for the contemporary audience. Sherry teaches at the Community College of Denver and Arapahoe Community College. Sherry's current research is in digital game-based learning, which involves the studies of the meaning of video games, the persuasive nature of video games, the rhetorical devices used in video games, and video games as existential metaphors. Uh, Sherry also serves as a games MOOC advisory board member, where her role is to offer support to Kay Novak, the instructor of the games MOOC. Uh, and we're definitely going to be talking more about that in a few minutes. I'm really looking forward to the conversation. I've looked at some of Sherry's uh, information and, and uh, her website and uh, amazing resources. But first, some technical notes before we get started. Sherry's going to be showing us some graphics along with live in-game experiences and pa some PowerPoint slides. Some of the live or recorded in-game scenes that you see may not have optimum Im image quality due to the lim limitations of YouTube, but we'll be posting higher quality images via Flickr, and links to those images and other resources will be posted on the description section of the recorded webinar back at the game's website. Now, during the webinar, you can ask questions at any time in the live comments section at the right of your YouTube screen. In Second Life, you can just post your questions in chat. We'll get to as many questions as we can during the session, and we're hoping to have a few minutes at the end for a general Q&A. Uh, we're going to be recorded and available, available for on-demand viewing at the Game MOOC YouTube channel at the same link you use to access the live webinar. We also want to acknowledge our organizers and uh, mighty support behind the scenes for tonight's event. Kay Novak, mentioned before, Kay is an instructional designer for Front Range Community College, organizer of the Games-Based Learning MOOC, program chair for Virtual World's Best Practices in Education, and chair-elect for the ISTE Special Interest Group for Virtual Environments, also a guild officer in the Educators Guild Cognitive Dissonance in World of Warcraft, as well as in game. Kay is one busy lady. And also, we would like to thank Chris Lukes, Associate Dean, Career and Technical Education at Colorado Community College System. He's also a guild officer in the Cognitive Dissonance Guild, as well as in the game community. And Sherry, I can't thank you enough for agreeing to do the webinar tonight on such short notice. We really appreciate the fact that you could step up and, and uh, bring your wealth of experience here. Thanks for coming. Thank you for inviting me. I'm very excited to present today. Great. So can you start off by telling us a little bit about your background as an educator? Well, I, uh, I have a multidisciplinary approach to my education. Um, I originally started off with English literature, then I went into religious studies, then I went into linguistics, then I started studying philosophy, then I focused on philosophy of mind, and somehow I ended up teaching rhetoric and composition <laughs> at the community colleges. Well, it sounds like all of that is coming together in, in, in uh, what you're teaching now. I mean, it gives you a wealth of experience to draw from. Yeah, I think that it is helping because I'm able to think more uh, flexibly about any kind of issue that comes up. So I'm able to apply some philosophical thinking as well as organize my thoughts using writing principles. Now, you've already done quite a few presentations on game-based learning, haven't you? You want to talk about that a little bit, uh, different uh, conferences? Yes. Um, Game-based learning is still new in terms of my presentations, but I have been doing, for example, at uh, Metro State University, I did present a, a, a presentation about Gamify the Classroom, and I showed educators an introduction to what is gamification, what are game mechanics, and I also showed them a few games. Some of them are serious games, and some of them are just casual games, but I teach them how to analyze it for their disciplines. Excellent. Well, 
can you show us some uh, of what you're some of what you're doing in the classroom now? I, I know you have some live in-game experiences lined up, and and why don't you go ahead and take it away? Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and share one of my slideshows here. Okay, so one of the games that I get educators to uh, do because it's easier for them to understand is Summerrest One. Okay. Okay. So, Summer Us 1 is actually just a web-based Flash game, and it is free. Um, and the game genre that it touches is fantasy, point-and-click adventure, and strategy. Um, so it's pretty easy to, to play. And I love using this game because it only takes about 30 minutes to an hour to play. And if I play this in group uh, with students in groups of three or four, it usually takes only 30 minutes to crack the game. Okay, so um, these are a few teaching strategies that I offer with this game. So because in rhetoric and composition, we have to teach students how to uh, identify logical fallacies as well as figure out exactly what is the logical order of uh, arguments in a text. So we treat video games as a text, and I ask my student to um, deduce the logical steps in the game. And they would have to tell me if certain parts of the uh, game step is logical and what other parts are not logical for them. Um, other things you can do if you're an art teacher, you can use the game to do art composition analysis. So you might be evaluating the game style, um, game artwork, um, also the colors and what are the influences that make the uh, game come alive. Because uh, Summer S1 is actually quite beautiful in terms of our composition when it first came out, even though it is a little bit outdated now. And also, in rhetoric and composition classes, we teach students to write evaluation essays, which means that they have to be able to tell us what is good or bad about something based on specific criteria. So I teach students um, basic game mechanics, and I ask them, okay, now evaluate the game mechanics in this game. Do you think those mechanics were used effectively? If not, if you were to write a letter to a game designer, what would you tell them to remove or add? Okay. So you mentioned before that, that your uh, involvement in games is relatively recent. Have you found your students to be more engaged and motivated using games in the classroom than before? Yes. Um, I actually use games for about two years now in the classroom, but my conference presentation is fairly new. And I did notice a lot that students just really enjoy coming to class. <laughs> really enjoy doing writing exercises because they are triggered or initiated by the gameplay. So instead of just writing about a news article that they have read or maybe about an advertisement that they have seen, they're actually playing the game through and then they're writing about it. Okay? And uh -huh. this slide right here, um, I'm just going to show you really quick because most of our community college students tend not to have computers with them. So I usually plug up my laptop at the front of the class and I find one student to volunteer as a game pilot. And what the game pilot does is that this student will take orders <laughs> from all the students in the classroom and he will control how the game goes based on uh, student uh, voting. And then the student gets to discuss the gameplay as they go. So I'm going to go ahead um, and show you how this game goes. So I'm going to click here. Okay. Now, the quality of this might not be so great because it is a flash game. Um, but just to show you as an example, this game does not have explicit explanation as to how to approach the game. It just starts this way. So I asked the student, um, what exactly are the logical cues right now in this entire game that you can figure out how to progress? So if you can see, and I don't know if you guys can see this, but there's a small arrow that's pointing right here, and it's basically telling you to click there. Okay. Okay, the, the, the music is not at good quality right now, but just to show you how this game flows. Okay, so the basic, the premise of this story is that there are two spaceships that are about to collide. Okay. So our little character uh, is trying to figure out 
exactly how to solve this problem. So now he's going to the other spaceship to figure out how to stop the spaceship from crashing into his own. Okay. So you can see that the art design is, is somewhat pretty, pretty interesting looking. Uh -huh. And this happens to be the uh, game designer. He kind of put his face right there. <laughs> um, so when I tell students to start playing this game, just randomly clicking on screen like what I'm doing right now is not going to help you solve the game. You have to really talk it out what are the logical steps before we can click on the game. So students, I usually ask them, okay, what do you see that is wrong about this image? So some student will figure out that, for example, this thing right here is supposed to be a ski lift. One of the lines of the ski lift fell down, so they would click here to put that back on there to fix the problem. Then I ask them, okay, what else looked like it's not quite right? So some student will figure out that here is the signpost and it's facing the wrong direction. So they would move this around, okay, to direct the person who's about to go to go this direction. However, if you see, if I click on the screen again, this ski lift is not moving because it happens to have no electricity. And the only thing on the screen that looks like it's coursing with electricity would be this box. And if I click on it, Nothing will happen because it doesn't have electricity. Now, most students will say, well, I see this keyhole. What am I supposed to do with that? So if we click through here, and I'll, and I'll stop this in just a second here. But um, OK. So it looks like a pipe, but it's actually deceptive. Let me see. OK. And you have to smoke it twice. Okay, now I can grab the key, put it in the keyhole, turn the machine on, and then I can press and the machine is actually working. Okay, so I'm going to stop right here just to show you guys an example of this, but it's totally the students have to really talk it out in order to play through this game. Now and I do want, yeah, go ahead. The name of the game again, it's Samorost. It's called Samorost, so it's S-A-M-O-R-O-S-T uh, hyphen one. And the links are all in my slideshow, which will be made available on the YouTube channel. Okay. okay. Now, I can totally see this being appropriate for high school and maybe even middle school as well as college. Don't you agree? Yes. I think that it, the directions are pretty easy. So um, for high school, or whether it's high school classrooms or whether it's uh, higher ed, um, it's really all about the assignment design for me. You can make the assignment quite complicated or you can make it more uh, uh, simple depending on the level of classroom that you're using this in. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and show you an assignment I designed based on Summerus for my uh, 122 course which is English Composition 2. Um, it's equivalent to basically sophomore level classes for uh, community colleges. Okay? okay. So I'm going to go ahead and show you this. Okay, now just, just as a heads up, this is a paper that three students or actually two students typed together in class using Google Docs because my classroom I run using the flipped classroom model. So students often are just doing activities in my class. I'm going to open this up here and I'm going to make this a little bit bigger so you guys can see. So this is an example of an evaluation essay that sophomore students have to be able to write in my class. And I asked them to do this first. I asked them, can you analyze what is logical and illogical about the game steps in Summer Us 1? So this is written by students, so I love all the grammar and spelling errors inside it to show you that this is written by students, okay? So first one, uh, they said, we found the first logical puzzle with, regarding, with regards to opening the engine room door where the player is required to enter a code in order to unlock the door. Upon initially opening the control panel door, the player has to click on the control panel a second time as they can see an object contained within. After the object has come out from the box, the player is presented with a control panel made of six total buttons, two rows with three columns. If the player clicks on the button, a red light comes up. So you can see that they are being extremely descriptive. They have to really examine the game very closely and take notes in order to write something like this. 
So for them, they found two logical solutions, and then they wrote out two illogical solutions, which means that they experience uh, uh, rage quit, <laughs> which means that uh, when they're playing, they want to quit the game because they can't figure out how to progress in the game. So they also identified places that didn't make sense to them at all. And then I asked them, okay, now that you figure out the logical step, can you tell me, can you come up with three criteria on your own to evaluate um, how good the game is for you? So down here, the student came up with three criteria. So they determined engaging storyline, graphics, and user friendliness. So under each of these uh, criteria, each of these criteria, they type a paragraph to explain how they feel about this game. And this is actually college level writing for evaluation, but it's completely using the video game to do this. You know, what's, what's interesting to me here is that in, in the Common Core State Standards that are, that are now being implemented across the country in, in K through 12, there's mm -hmm. an element in the English, English uh, learning, learning Arts, ELA, uh, part of the curriculum for technical writing. And this is a great example of how you could use a game to teach that aspect of writing because they're actually taking apart and explaining a system. Uh, yes, and I think that even for high school students when we are talking about common, uh, common core uh, standards, um, if we're talking about higher order thinking, um, they are supposed to be able to analyze and synthesize the text. So this is actually analysis because in order for you to tell me uh, what part of the game was effective, you have to really focus on specific objects inside the game, uh, break it apart, tell me what else can be improved about it in order to show me you understand what analysis is. Yep, it, it's a really good part for an uh, example of good problem solving skills and uh, critical analysis, critical thinking skills, and also critical writing skills. Yeah, that's, that's my intention, and that's why I've been so, so much sold on using games for, for education. Because, again, video game is just another form of multimodal text, and I really love using them. Is Samarust free, is, or is there a fee involved? This is, Samarust 1 is completely free. <laughs> um, Samarust 2 is available um, for a fee, but it's only $5. Um, so I think it's really worth paying five dollars just to play the second one, but the first one is completely free, so everyone can go ahead and try that out. Impressive stuff. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, you're welcome. Okay. Now, sh should I go on and show you other things that I've done in the class? Please. I, I, I've been waiting for this all day ever since looking at your website. You have uh, <laughs> a, a, a number of great examples, and I'm hoping we can get to as many as possible. Okay, um, so I'm going to sk skip along, but please stop me, and, and if anyone is interested in seeing other ones, I will show, okay? Oh, and by can the I way, just to remind everyone, all the viewers, you can ask questions. Uh, don't forget, you can ask questions in chat in Second Life or in the comments section on the right of your page in YouTube, and we'll try to work them in as much as we can, okay? Okay, okay. So I'm going to go ahead and show you guys the second game. It's called Bioshock. Um, but this is the web version. So if you're familiar with Bioshock for PC or Bioshock for PlayStation, this is actually a web version um, Bioshock created to kind of sell their, their um, PC game. Um, but because it is free, I like to use free games because a lot of our students can't really afford expensive games. So I love using these free games with them. Um, okay. So exactly what is Bioshock? It's kind of like the previous game. It is web-based, and it is Flash game, and it is free. Um, the genres that it touches on is text-based, uh, text and it's actually a web comic at the same time a, a strategy game, point-and-click point adventure game. And also, I love this because it is only 30 minutes to an hour to play, and if you group students in three to four, it actually takes only 30 minutes to finish. Okay, so... I hope that um, um, if in our audience we have K-12 teachers, some of you guys can relate to some of these teaching strategies because these writing uh, standards that I have here probably apply to high school writing as well. Um, so the first one I recommend is classification and division writing. So you get the students to play it and you tell them to classify and divide the monsters that they see in the game into categories. That's actually a hard task to do because students have to understand how to come up with the category. Um, and in order for them to do that, they need to actually analyze the characteristics of the monsters in order to figure out, okay, what monster fall under what category, okay? 
Um, second one is descriptive writing. So descriptive writing requires that students write sentences using sensory details, meaning physical senses, not emotional senses. So the one I wrote here is describe the physical appearance and attributes of each type of monster. And this actually correlates with that first one, which is the classification division writing. Um, number three is context and situation analysis. When and where is the story set? What happened here? So if any of you uh, are familiar with um, the PlayStation version of Bioshock, Bioshock is actually set in the 1960s, uh, early 1960s, and there was a panic during the time, and the story was set where everyone escaped um, underground, uh, uh, below sea level, and created a city there because they were afraid that there will be uh, a nuclear uh, war and everyone will die. So everyone went down there. But also what's interesting about this game <laughs> is that it's actually built its entire story based on objectivist uh, philosophy by Ayn Rand, which is the promotion of individualism, about promoting the self. So in this game, it's actually a very, very sad game. And it's actually an existential game as well, where after you play, um, uh, people get very selfish and they start to destroy each other. So the civilization becomes smaller and smaller and I don't really want to give the storyline or the plot away, but it's worth your time playing because it is a very, very rich story. So the research of the setting comes in because of the 1960s factor. Okay. Other things that you can do. So the research, the philosophy I discussed, also rhetorical analysis. So rhetoric is a study of the art of persuasion. So there are a lot of arguments inside this game that's implicit, that is not actually typed on screen, but I want my students to go, okay, I played it, now I know, um, I need to know what exactly is, is it trying to persuade me to believe in. So I ask students to figure out the implicit and explicit arguments in the main character's dialogues. And also what kind of morality does each character espouse. That's very important to me. And lastly, as with any game, I still tell them to evaluate game design because I think game mechanics, understanding game mechanics is part of understanding rhetoric. Because game mechanics are actually rhetorical devices in disguise. It's just another term, in my opinion, for rhetorical devices. Okay, and I think instead of opening this one, because we do have a lot of games to go through, and I don't want to take up too much time, this slideshow, again, is available for anyone to view, and I'm going to go ahead. And you talk, and, and you, you promise oh, yes. to show Angry Birds, too. Yes, I'm, I'm going to do that right now, <laughs> right now. <laughs> okay, I know everyone's kind of sick of Angry Birds, but... It still has very deep meaning, okay? If you, if you know how to analyze it, it still has very deep meaning. So this particular slideshow is called Angry Birds as Paratext. So I'm going to open this up. All right. Okay, so <laughs> what is Angry Birds? Okay, I have to set my uh, slideshows as a definition first, you know, the philosophy background. But most of us know it is a flash game. Um, and it came out with numerous editions and spinoffs, and pretty much it's released on every platform possible. It started on Facebook, and now you have it on PC, Mac, Android, EOS, Xbox, you name it. And the game genre, I say it's strategy, but according to Angry Birds itself, they call itself puzzle game. And the objective, you know, you're using birds to fly crash into all the green pigs. Um, because, as you <laughs> and I just circle them, so these are your Angry Birds. And over here is that king pig, and these are all his evil minions, and they basically stole eggs from these birds, so now their birds are trying to destroy them to get the uh, eggs back. I like this game because the playing time, really, it's one to three minutes per round. Soon can play on their phone. It's really quick and easy. So I have to explain what exactly is a paratext before I continue. Um, so paratext, I'm borrowing this from literary theory, even though I am teaching rhetoric and composition, because paratext is related to persuasion. And the word by itself means beyond the written word. And it's a concept by the literary theorist Gerard Jeanette to refer to external things accompanying the text that's not made by the author. So Outside the text, um, for example, if you have a novel, the cover of the novel, the back of the novel, the introduction, the review on the back of the novel are not written by the author, him or herself. But those are 
paratext that actually supports the understanding of the text itself. Okay, so I'm going to skip along here, but paratext is important in terms of video game study because paratext also allows us to study any cultural, social, or rhetorical influences that affected the way the paratext is designed. Because in rhetoric and composition, we talk about how writing is always customized for a specific audience. And if we interpret text, uh, especially video games as paratext, that allows us to address social or, or external situation that affected how the video game was constructed in the first place. Okay, so I'm going to skip along. Okay, so now here's my first claim. Um, I think that Angry Birds uh, serve as an excellent paratext. Um, and I'm going to go here. And I know that the narrative is actually quite short. Okay, it's a very basic premise. But if you take a look at the game, the game is extremely addictive for those of us who actually touched it. It is pretty humorous, and it actually adds on to its persuasiveness, meaning that it makes us want to keep playing. And also, it does address its current trends and concerns. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and show you. Yeah, um, and I found these numerous political, social, and philosophical interpretation of Angry Birds, and they do a much better job than I can here. So I'm going to show you guys a few of these. So this is a screenshot. Uh, this came from um, television tropes, and what they did they, was they curated a whole bunch of articles on the internet that basically is analyzing uh, Angry Birds. And if you guys access the slideshow, you can click here and then go to the site itself. So, for example, the first one, uh, alternative character interpretation. This person says, uh, this article imagines things from the pig's points of perspective. So, <laughs> basically... The entire game, we are using the birds to kill the pigs, but this article is basically saying, well, how come we don't look at the game from the pig's perspective, which is obviously terrifying, because they're obviously being constantly chased by the birds, and they're always risking death, okay? This one, <laughs> I find it rather interesting. Glenn Beck thinks it's a political metaphor. Um, I don't know <laughs> how that is a political metaphor for him, but it's interesting that that interpretation came out. Another one here that's interesting is this black sheep. So the green bird, this comment says it's not really recognized, uh, only being included in a few t-shirts and such. They released the green and big brother uh, bird plushes, however, it hasn't appeared in Angry Birds Reel yet. So this is an example of paratext. So paratext and also um, there's a transmediality with paratext. And transmediality means that uh, a medium that transcends itself. So Angry Birds is a video game, but you can see uh, uh, plush toys, you can see uh, t-shirts, coffee cups that carry the Angry Birds signs. Those are different mediums that carry Angry Birds, so it transcends itself. That's why there's transmediality in video games. Uh -huh. Sherry, I'm Sherry, quick question. Is, is this going to be available as a resource as part of the recorded webinar? Because it's very difficult to see it on the screen right now. I'm not sure our viewers can see Oh, oh well. yes, yes. Um, everything here on the screenshot, and I apologize about that, everything on the screenshot is, is all in the slideshow, so everything I Excellent. show you today is on, on, on the website. So I'm okay. going to skip along here, I think, but there were some certain things that I mentioned on the screenshot. I talk about existential despair, existential horror, uh, logos or logical appeal of the game. Um, and also, for example, another one where it says, someone says, isn't that strange that pigs can fly? Which is the moment, <laughs> the moment when you think reality is setting in where virtual reality serves as an opposition of the real or beyond the liminal. So I'm trying to make it very complex, but as you can see, the game itself is very easy to understand. Okay. I All love right. the way you're putting layers and layers of meaning and interpretation on top of a, a relatively simple game that, that, that someone on the surface would just think, oh, that's easy. Yeah, I, I, here's the thing. I don't, I don't believe that you have to. I, I, I love serious games, but I don't believe that you have to use serious games to construct complicated assignments. It's always about the pedagogy. What exactly is your theory behind your pedagogy exactly. that drives the rigor of an assignment? Exactly. Right. So I'm going to, you know, and I, <laughs> for those of you who still don't know where Angry Bird is, I did include this link on Facebook. So go ahead and click on it, you know, uh, when you access the slideshow and you'll see it. Okay. 
Um, now, I did include a few of these, and I, I will show one more um, right here. Okay, so another thing that I'm studying right now, so my research interest is also um, researching games as existential metaphors. And what I mean by that is I think games also um, acts as a representation of our existential despairs, existential angst. Um, so I'm going to show you this particular game. No, I did not prepare a slideshow for it because um, there are already six slideshows on the screen. But I'm going to go ahead and go directly to the game. This game is also free. It's called Every Day, The Same Dream. Okay? And it's especially created to question existentialism. So I'm going to go ahead and click through here. Oop. Click on the link. Okay. It is a flash game. Okay. And the direction is very simple. So it says click to start and press arrows and space to play. Okay. And again, I have to warn you, the audio is not great, but we're going to go through it really quickly. So now, you see, on the screen, there are no explicit messages. Um, the game doesn't tell us where to start or where to end. So you have to kind of figure out on your own what to do. So right now, I'm just using my arrow key and walking this guy. Okay. So now I'm at wardrobe, and I'm pressing the space key to get him dressed. Because obviously he shouldn't be leaving the, the bedroom without getting dressed, right? Uh-huh. Usually. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, this is, we have to assume, um, this is his wife, and she said, morning, dear. So, I'm walking by, I press the space bar to close the TV, and I do apologize again for the audio. It's a little bit rough. Okay. So, I talk to her, and she's telling me, come on, honey, you're late. So I got to go to work. So I get out of the room. Okay. Now here's an elevator. I should I press the button to open the elevator? Okay. Now I go inside. Now if I go over here, here's the elevator lady, and I talk to her, and she says something very strange. To me. She says, five more steps, and you will be a, a new person." Now that's an un unusual sentence to tell somebody. Especially before coffee. <laughs> yes. So I'm not going to play this through because I know the audio quality is a little bit rough because of the flash game. Um, but I wanted to uh, just let me let me close this off. And again, all these games are free, and you can access them on the slideshow. And what's the name of this game again? Um, the game is uh, called Every Day the Same Dream. So I'm going to go ahead and open that up. Okay. And what is significant about that particular game is that actually what the <laughs> students get uh, very excited when they're playing the game. But when they discover that they are doing the same thing over and over again, that nothing changes every single day, they start to interpret something. They go, Miss Jones, why, why is this game on repeat? Why is every day exactly the same? I said, well, let's, let's talk about some existential concepts, shall we? So that generates conversation as we go into the discussion. Yeah. So that game is actually kind of depressing. <laughs> 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 Sounds like real life. <laughs> yeah, it, it's very too close to real life. And I, again, I'm not going to give the, the ending away because if I give the ending away, it's going to be a little bit depressing. But it's very much worth your time. And all the games I show you guys today are all free. And I really believe in, you know, testing some free games out and then playing some, some you know, expensive games. So can I, can I ask you, how do you pick your games for your classes? Because I, I think our listeners would like to hear what your process is. Because if they're thinking about incorporating your games into, into their classroom, that would be a valuable um, um, tutorial for them. Right. Um, my, my concept, and it always goes back to the multimodal um, aspect, and I'll take myself off screen share. Um, but yeah, I, I treat all things, and, and this is influenced by Derrida and Foucault, okay? Nothing goes beyond the text. Everything is a text, which means that I can be a text, you can interpret me for meaning. Now, one of my job in rhetoric and composition is to teach students to interpret and develop visual literacy which means that if they are looking at an advertisement on TV, 
they need to have the skills to understand how to interpret it, to understand the manipulation, the message just behind the advertisement. Well, same thing. Somehow when we play video games, we forget. There are messages hidden inside video games. There are moral agendas inside video games. So I tend to like to choose games that are uh, narrative rich. Um, they don't have to be, but most of them I choose that. They also uh, focus on one specific concept. So for example, that every day the same dream, it focuses on that existential concept of, of questioning, of despair, of the sameness of every day, mm -hmm. of why I am here. You know, So that's really important to me. And also, I think that the gameplay does not have to be very complex. And it's because, you know, uh, Angry Birds, it takes one to three minutes to play. Summer Us 1, it takes probably 30 minutes, an hour, um, if you don't like to analyze things. <laughs> but it, they, they're very short uh, game play time. And I think that those are what I select. Um, and obviously, I have to be searching and scouring the Internet a lot because that's what I do usually. Okay. Um, yes. we, we have a question okay. that came in on chat. And the question is, this doesn't look like Joseph Campbell's The Hero's Journey. Um, does okay. that... Yeah, I, this... Yeah, I'm not... No, I am not talking about Joseph Campbell, The Hero's Journey. He's actually talking about the archetypes that came out of C.G. Yoon, who's who is basically... And actually, my, my in my studies, I study C.G. Yoon very extensively. And uh, he's a psych, uh, psych pole analyst, and Joseph Campbell was his student. So Joseph Campbell uh, oh. uh, translated uh, C.G. Yoon's psychological principles into interpreting ancient stories. Okay, and one of his premise, one of uh, Joseph Campbell's premise is that um, in every single uh, uh, old type of linear narrative, you can find specific characteristics. So you have the old man, uh, you, uh, well, the wise man. You have the hero. You have the anti-hero. Um, you have the shadow. Those particular characters always show up. But these actually came out of uh, CGM's theory, which is that these particular characters are inside our minds, that we see them in our minds, and that's why we construct the world in such a way. Okay? So mm -hmm. I'm not really interested in looking, in my uh, studies, I'm not really interested in looking at those archetypal characters. What I'm actually looking at is the messages hidden inside a game. What composition, what elements in the game come together to persuade you? What messages are hidden inside? And that is that has a little, very little to do with the characters in themselves. But by doing that, you're teaching your students how to navigate life also. You're teaching them about the clues that they should be um, picking up on that they may gloss over in their everyday lives. That they 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 because because right now uh, the li literature I'm reading about what's happening with the uh, the modern generation with multitasking and all the different uh, stimulus that they have and uh, uh, constantly being online and constantly communicating is that they're just not spending a lot of time really thinking about things and really looking into things. It's all on the surface. It's an inch. Uh, deep and a mile wide and what you're teaching them is to really look at something deconstruct it explain it and solve problems and I think that's a skill that they really need to have drummed into them because of the world that we live in right now and I I, I agree with you and, and thank you for saying all that <laughs> um, because when I say this people think I'm doing trippy things uh, very strange things but there's such a thing called information overload, especially with all the technology coming. And the medium, uh, media is being delivered on mobile. They're delivering all kinds of different uh, information, all kinds of content. And when you don't teach students to figure out how to uh, see the hidden messages inside, it's, they're just going to gloss over and they're going to be persuaded and have no idea why they think in a certain way. Um, so video games, again, it... Why do we have to use video games? Why not use anything else? Well, it's visually rich. If I were to use multimodal text, and again, multimodal text is a text that contains two of five semiotic systems. So I said earlier, auditory, visual, uh, linguistic, gestural, and spatial. So gestural means the movement of the body, okay? And spatial means things in relation to other in space. Now, when you talk about a video, for example, a YouTube video, sometimes it will uh, use two or three of the semiotic systems. But video games, most video games I've encountered uh, use all five. They are the richest multimodal text I've encountered, and I cannot motivate students any more than video games because sometimes when I'm in the classroom, I'm not really there for them. They, they just forget that I was there. 
Yes. So <laughs> that that must be a, a sort of a, a a great feeling. And at the same time, it's like, oh, they don't need me. But that that was the point, wasn't it? Yeah, I actually I have no problem with that. I think here's here's the thing about mentoring, and if we are going to go back to Joseph Campbell and talking about archetypal characters, uh, the wise man. It's the wise man and Joseph Campbell stories, okay? The wise men appear at first to guide the hero along on the journey. So the hero will know what to do and force the hero to take on a journey that hero might not want to take, okay? He's the wise man. But at the end of the story, you're not going to see the wise man. The wise man usually dies off or he disappears because you don't need him anymore, right? Right. He's the sage and you gave him the, the information. And sometimes I see myself well, as the wise woman who <laughs> is giving the information to the students and if the students are able to you know get all the information then I think I've done my job if at the end of the class they still expect me to babysit them and say okay this is exactly how you do this do that I felt that I failed as an instructor you know I, you've just hit on one of my key philosophies my 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 feeling is that our job as educators is no longer to teach them stuff it's to teach them how to find out about their own stuff and how to solve problems as they come up. Um, I, I, I uh, quote this statistic I read uh, a while back that this one gentleman is predicting by the year 2015 the amount of to the total amount of accumulated accumulated knowledge on the planet will double every 35 days. So wow. how can you prepare a student for that if you don't prepare them to rapidly assimilate new information, solve problems using the most current information, and, and have those learning and critical thinking skills and problem solving skills to apply to the new information. We can't just teach them content anymore and they're done like, like you know, 10, 20, 30 years ago. Yeah. We have to teach them how to deal with new content, new problems. Most of the games, most of the games, most of the jobs that are going to be going to be out there in 10 years or so, we don't even know what, what the names are. I mean, five years ago, who would have thought that you needed a, 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 a a social media manager in most companies, which is now a common <laughs> position. Five years ago, who, who ever heard of that? Yeah, that, right? that's a very, very good point. And also, uh, we were talking about the, the uh, half-life of knowledge, which is the same conversation you're having um, in, in the game smoke. Um, we discussed how, you know, whatever we learn, it only has a half-life, so whatever we think is relevant is going to be maybe disproven or something else will add on to it to refine that knowledge. And when we, again, have this information overload and everything is coming to us, how can we expect students to survive this world without telling them, okay, it's just content, it's the way you manage through that content that's most important. It's a methodology, it's the way you think about the content, that that's what we're really confirming to you. Not just, let me memorize every single thing on the planet, because you can't. You right. cannot. You're not a computer. Right. Totally agree. We have a question that came in on chat. Uh, it's... The question is, what level of English class are you using these games in, and are there any? Have you used it in any of the developmental English classes? Oh, thank thank you for that question. Um, that reminds me, I actually <laughs> I actually teach ENG 060, ENG 090, ENG 121, ENG 122. So I actually teach all levels. Um, but what does but, that mean for folks who don't under who don't know the terminology? Right. I'm sorry. Um, so ENG 060 and ENG 090 are developmental uh, English courses. So 060 is a little bit lower, and then 090 is the next level. And then when they get to ENG 121, that's college transfer, which means that they can transfer the credit to any four-year at that level. Mm -hmm. um, so when I design my syllabus, and I do design new syllabi every semester um, because I like a challenge. <laughs> so, um, I and couldn't I do tell. New things. Yeah, yeah, I, I get bored with my own syllabi. So um, when I design them, I always think, okay, because I'm teaching most of the time 060 and then 120 on the same time, I say, okay, how do I bridge this? How do I see a succession um, of knowledge being built here? So there is that structure. And the games that you guys see, again, I have to emphasize, it is not the complexity of the game itself. And I know we're, we're, we're serious games, I'm not knocking them. I do love serious games when I can get my hands on them. But really, it's the way you construct the assignment, the complexity of what you want them to write that makes the game work or not. So I can use angry birds at any level. I could do 060, 090, 120, 122. We know that uh, CU Boulder, they are using it for junior and senior uh, students um, using angry birds. So always, it always fall back on the assignment construction. And if you guys are interested in how I you know, create the assignment, 
those slideshows that I put on the website, which is uh, available to everyone who's seen this uh, webinar, um, they show that some of the assignments I put up there. And also the students who actually typed the sample that you see there reflect the assignment design that I've given them. That's excellent. And, and um, uh, you know, I before we started officially, I invited you to join Cognitive Dissonance and World of Warcraft, and I, I know you're too busy to spend the time in there, but I'll tell you what, I, I'm ready to put up a petition to make you an honorary honorary member because wow. <laughs> we, 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 need, we, we need your expertise. Um, but talking about massively online role-playing games, I, I guess you sort of explained why you don't use those, because you like to use the free, quick, get them into one class uh, game, and it's not the complexity of the game that you're necessarily taking advantage of, it's the complexity of the pedagogy that you're layering on top of it. And, and that's what's so elegant about your approach, and it's actually very refreshing and creative, and I haven't seen that before, and, and, and uh, th it's really an excellent example on how you can take a simple game, a free game, and, and turn it into a very valuable classroom exercise for multidisciplines. And I have to be honest, <laughs> it's not that I don't like MMO, but I, it, it, MMO, this is one thing that I've actually encountered with students, is that it requires very high level and hand, hand and eye coordination, okay? I am a thinker. I think a long time before I make a decision. So by the time I finish thinking, a monster already ate me, right? Oh, you could be so dead. <laughs> <laughs> so I am practicing. So like with all the GameSmook member, because I'm also a student in GameSmook, and I've been learning a heck of a lot from, from GameSmook, I am playing with Minecraft. So I'm starting slow. Uh, my husband's playing EVE Online, so he's trying to teach me that. But I'm starting very slowly, so I am not knocking MMO. My knowledge of, of video game just stopped the moment I started teaching. So I stopped at Final Fantasy VII, and that's an RPG uh -huh. game. Um, so I'm learning. I'm, it's like taking baby step. I'm, I'm riding a bike again. So I'm pretty sure that in the near future, you'll be hearing me talk about some kind of MMORPG, and I'm figuring out an assignment direction with that. Cool. Well, look forward to seeing you uh, in the guild. Um, we have another 13 minutes or so. Do you want to show another game? Sure. I can do that, yeah. Um, I think so far we talk about all those games, but we haven't really talked about a uh, serious game. And I hope that the flash will hold up. So I'm going to go ahead and share uh, something else here. And, and stop me if you have questions or anything like that, okay? So this one, I think uh, our members at GameSmook have seen this one, which is called International Racing Squirrels. Um, and this particular game, I'll just pop it up. I won't open this one. This one is actually a uh, business management and it's also free and it came out of gamesforchange.org and this game uh, forces the, <laughs> the player to think about annuities, taxes, banking, what's the difference between savings account um, and what's, uh, what is interest rate and the student have to play as a squirrel and the squirrel have to play race after race after race to gain enough money to keep themselves afloat. And it's actually, to me, an existential game again because they keep redoing the same thing over and over and over again without much progress. So that's another game you guys can play. I'm going to show you this one, which is one of my favorite. This one's called Question Knot, and I'm going to open it up. And this is actually made by the maker of Summer Rust. They were commissioned by BBC to make a serious game for BBC. And in this game... It has uh, three elements. Ooh, so it's a little bit loud. Um, yes, so it has three elements in here. It actually goes through literacy, so English, math, and science. So I'm going to show you how this works here. So right now you see this, this image, and it's also very beautiful. If I click here, wait, hold on. Let me click here. I think that's what I have to do. Yes. Okay. So the hat, when it floats up, it demonstrates that there's bubbles that's floating up. So the character says, okay, I guess that's air that I could use for my balloon. So he's making a balloon right now. Oh, blue's my favorite color. <laughs> okay. Now, he's basically making himself an air balloon float. So he's, he's going up. So I did this correctly, and it was very simple what I did. All right. Now, here's your second level. Okay, so first level is extremely easy. Now, you see in this scene, you have grandma sitting there typing. You have grandpa sitting here. 
And we know that somehow this character needs to interact with either the grandfather or the grandmother, okay? So I click on the grandmother, she looks at me, then she ignores me, okay? If I click on the grandfather, he's not doing anything because my click doesn't work. So this is how you solve this particular one. So I click this paper off, okay? And then it reveals that there's a plug that keeps the light on. So I'm going to unplug the light to get the, the old man's uh, attention, okay? So he's like, oops, I can't open the light anymore. What am I going to do? Okay. And Larry, can you guys see this uh, game yeah. okay or should I make it? Okay. Okay. See it well. So now that I got this old man's attention, I click on him again and this is where the serious game come up. So if you can't see right there, I'm going to say, let me see if I can make it bigger. Yeah, if you can make it bigger, that would be great. And, and yeah. by the way, one more plug. If anyone has any questions, we're in our last 10 minutes. Please type any questions into the YouTube uh, comments on the right or into the chat in Second Life. Okay. I think this is the biggest I can make the game, um, but I'm just going to read this off to you. It says, rhyme is A. When two words sound alike, B. When two words start with the same letter or C, a type of Chinese poetry. So I'm going to select A, and when I do that, it says, that's right. Hat, bat, rat, mat, and fat, all right. Okay? So now this bubble, this text bubble, turned into fuel that will raise my balloon. So next one, it says, when reading persuasive writing, you should... Believe everything you read, especially if it's in a newspaper. Assume the writer is lying, especially if you are reading an advert. Or C, think about what the other side of the story may be. So we're going to select C. That's right. Okay. So I'm going to move along here so I can show you the third level, okay? So in the middle of a story, keep introducing new characters. Change a scene at least twice. Describe what happens to your character. Uh -huh. So. Oops, so that's not quite right. You can change a scene if you need to, but you don't need you don't have to. So it gives you instant feedback if I did something wrong. Okay, so I'm gonna show before Jill. Okay. So if you guys can't see very well, so I'm just gonna move this along here. Okay, which of the word come? <laughs> this is like a test for me too. Okay. Yes. Okay, and we're almost there. We're almost there. Okay, poetry. Okay. Again, a story. I think I'm going to stop here. But when you get to the third level of this game, it will start asking you math questions. So you interact, and in order for this text bubble to appear, you have to answer, uh, you have to do certain uh, steps logically in order to get the text bubble to appear. So this is one example of a serious game because it actually teaches you something. The idea behind a serious game is that it's educational, right? In itself, right. the nature of it is educational. Okay. Now if cool. we can oh go ahead. No, we've got some questions coming in when you you're when you reach a natural break point, I'll I'll uh, ask you. Uh, okay, okay. I'll just show you one more and actually let's see. <clears throat> Okay. Now, this particular game is called Mr. Bree, and it actually won uh, Art Game of 2011. Um, and it is free again, but on Congregate, if you guys are going to use congregate.com, just remember that they do have advertisements before every game, so it's a little bit annoying. Um, but this game is well worth your time. It is a philosophy game. And the premise of this game, and I think I might switch, oop, let's see. Let me go to the actual site here. Hold on. Oop. Uh-oh. Maybe they took it off. Hold on one sec. Okay, Mr. Green. Okay, so it's hosted here. Okay. Okay, share, share your screen again. Are you sharing your screen? Uh, oh, okay, let, me, let me try again. Okay, so there are advertisements. There we go. Yeah, so I'm, I might have to, we might have to wait. That's the one thing about some of the free games online, is that it does have advertisement at the beginning before you can actually... Well, you know what, we, we've only got about six minutes. Minutes left. So while that's okay. playing, why don't I, I ask you one question? Uh, do you see yourself as uh, teaching information literacy? Um, no, I'm sorry. Can you say that one more time, Larry? Do you see yourself 
as teaching information literacy? Yes, um, that's actually part of my course. Um, what, what you guys are seeing, just like any other presentation, I can only see uh, show you parts of what I do in the classroom. But at the beginning of the course, I actually teach them how to analyze web sources. I give them six criteria on how to analyze uh, uh, the credibility of a source. So for example, do you know who the author is? Can you find any resources on the author? Who is the publisher of a web source? Um, how relevant is this in information? Okay, so is it recently and within 10 years? Because we know of all this uh, half life of knowledge, the closer it is within the five years range, that's when we say it's relevant. So students have to actually do a whole day of workshop analyzing web sources before they can even touch any multimodal text in my class. So definitely, information literacy is number one in my class. Yep, that's a big yes. Um, next question Do you have any games where reading is the help? We're, or I'm sorry, do you have any games where reading the help information is part of the assignment? Um, reading the help information part of the assignment. Um, you know, here's the thing. I, when a well, I, guess says, I guess they're critiquing the help in the game. Oh, okay. So uh, perhaps you're, you're, perhaps I think the question perhaps is that maybe the game is not very clear. Right, so when they're reading the, the help, the student might not understand it. Is that what I'm getting at? Yeah, I, I, I would read into that. That's what I think they would be getting at. We're reading the help and, and critiquing the help to see if it's actually an effective uh, uh, help, help system for the game itself and doing analysis on that. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, that's part of the, uh, because I teach students to analyze game mechanics, so if part of the game mechanics is the direction that moves them forward and they don't understand the direction, then the student will say, well, if, if I were to write the direction, this is how I would write it to fix the problem. So yeah, they definitely have to do that too. Okay, so um, one more question we have. Uh, do you have students ever create games on, them, on their own as part of your, your work? Uh, that's a wonderful question. Um, if everything goes as according to plan. In 2013, we might get students to do two things. So one is we're going to experiment with GameStar Mechanics because I have made a game on GameStar Mechanics already. Mm -hmm. um, so I know that it works and we're going to try to do argument-based persuasive games through GameStar Mechanics. Um, the other game that we're going to get probably 122 level students or basically English Comp 2, sophomore level class, is that they're going to use RPG Maker to make a very complex RPG for the entire semester. So we'll be teaching them to analyze games such as mm -hmm. Bioshock, such as Fallout 3. So while they're playing, they're going to record on what exactly was effective about that game. And then they're going to translate what they've learned from those games and put it into their own game design. So that's what we're going to do. So definitely that's going to happen. That's exciting. Yeah. We'll have to have you back on when that happens because I'd like to see the results of that. Yeah, me too. <laughs> okay, so uh, I'm already asking you, <laughs> and you're okay. already saying yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm I'm always excited. You know, I'm always excited to share what we're doing. Okay, we only have a couple of minutes left, but I, I wanted to give you an opportunity to talk about the games MOOC, and okay. and even if, if Kay wants to get involved on, on in this and just talk a little bit about the games MOOC and what you're doing there, how successful it's been, the kind of experiences you have, what you're teaching, because uh, I I think our viewers may be interested in being part of that MOOC. Okay, uh, I think, okay, so, okay, so I, I absolutely love what's happening at Games MOOC because originally, because of the title, MOOC, you know, Massive Online Open Course, you think of it as a course, but what we come to find out was we basically build a community of educators who are helping each other understand tough concepts. Um, and because we are also self-starters, it's not like students where we have to force students <laughs> to participate. Um, educators are all helping uh, to understand what game-based uh, game -based learning is. And we have people curating um, on Digo and so far on Tw uh, Flickr, uh, basically games that they have played, uh, what worked and what didn't work. And we're basically building a giant database on GameSmook, and I'm really, really excited about that. And I know that Kay said that uh, we will probably return in June. I think I'm, I'm right on that. Um, in June, and we'll be doing another Games MOOC number three, and everyone can participate as well. So is there a Games MOOC going on right now? Yes, it is still going on, so we're in week six. 
We might have a week seven where we're going to go over review, um, review some of the materials. But then after week seven, we'll go back onto hiatus, and then game number, a uh, game mode number three will come back. And I'm sure that Kay is going to incorporate more interesting materials in that course. Well. I, I see Kay typing in, in our uh, back channel here that spring 2013 you'll be back up. Oh, see? So it's not going to be as long as June. <laughs> and and um, I'm hoping that somewhere they can put up a link or, or uh, actually they can probably get it at the, uh, the game website, the link we put up before. I'm sure there's information there about that. And I would um, encourage everyone to join. Uh, if you're interested further, because uh, it's a very rich experience and it's free. <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. I love that. It's free. Well, we're out of time, and Sherry, I, I can't thank you enough. I mean, just an excellent presentation. I, I know we're going to have you back again. I think that that what you're doing is groundbreaking, and you're taking you're taking uh, everyday free games and and layering on really valuable educational experiences for your students uh, that that they're going to develop skills that'll last them for a lifetime. So thank you and so much. I, yeah, and thank you so much, and I would love to learn more from your guild as well. <laughs> okay, we'll, we'll, we'll try to make that happen. And I'd like to thank uh, Kay Novak and Chris Lukes for helping us stage the webinar. And most of all, thanks to you folks for viewing and for participating and for all the great questions you have. And please join us at the game website to be, and learn a little bit about how you can incorporate gaming strategies in your instructional endeavors. And for all of us at game, good night. Take care. This is Larry Coco signing off, and happy gaming. Yeah, happy